Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will continue my conversation with you about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, in the previous chapter or previous reading, uh, we had reached uh, page 59, and the instructive moment there where Freire is talking about praxis, right? So I'll briefly touch upon that and then move on to the next section. Now, here's what we read. Uh, and it, one of the gravest obstacles to the achievement liberation of liberation is that oppressive reality absorbs those within it and thereby acts to submerge human beings' consciousness. Okay. Now, that is what we talked about last time, right? Um, and then what he goes on to say is functionally oppression is domesticated. To no longer be prey to its force, one must emerge from it and turn upon it. So basically, as I already talked about it last time, uh, we do internalize the logic of the oppressive system and that domesticates us, that keeps us, or what is domestication, right? That we don't question the world around us, we just perform the actions that, the logic of it we have internalized. And that we cannot escape just naturally through the teleological movement of time. For that we must struggle and that is what he calls praxis, a combination of reflection, critical reflection, and action, right? Which is absolutely necessary first step, one could say, towards liberation. Okay, then where we are starting today, there is a quote by Jose Luis Fiori, and I'm not going to translate the quote because, I mean, of course, I don't have the linguistic skills to do that, but thankfully, Freire himself unpacks the quote within his discussion, and we'll start our con conversation from that. And I'm going to just put the main document on the screen for a few moments as I read so that you can follow it, and then I'll follow it up with the conversation. Okay, so after the quote, he goes on and it says, in affirming this, uh, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, I think I, I have skipped a little ahead. I've gone to Lukacs instead. Uh, but, okay, so we are here at this quote right now, right? And here is where we start. Making real oppression more oppressive still by adding to it the realization of oppression. And that's a direct quote, uh, translation of the quote correspond to the dialectical relation between the subjective and the objective. Only in this interdependence is an authentic praxis possible, without, without which it is impossible to resolve the oppressor-oppressed contradiction. To achieve this goal, the oppressed must confront reality critically, simultaneously objectifying and acting upon that reality. A mere perception of reality not followed by this critical intervention will not lead to a transformation of objective reality, precisely because it is not a true perception. This is the case of a purely subjectivist perception by someone who forsakes objective reality and creates a false substitute. All right, so there's quite a lot to unpack over here. But what the important point is that in order for the oppressed to know the oppression, the oppressing, the structure of the oppression, oppression must be made more palpable, right? Must be made tangible in a way, right? And that can only be done through reflection and a practice based on that reflection, right? Um, more than that, he goes on to say, 
uh, that as we had in the previous lecture talked about this dialectical relationship between objectivity and subjectivity, right? So the objective reality is out there. You know, it exists. We perform our identities within it, right? Understanding that objective reality critically is crucial to any praxis of liberation. Understanding it subjectively will then lead to false perception. What is subjectivity that I bring my own way of looking at the world to its understanding? And what that then does is that I still look at the world from the ideology in which I am embedded or which constructs my consciousness or which if even if you go through Althusser, which makes the world intelligible to us. That's why there is this emphasis on subjective experience, but the understanding the reality critically so that we can see it beyond the subjectivity which has been shaped already, which uh, the system in which we exist has created. So why is it crucial? So think of it this way. If you have internalized through religious discourse, religious ideology or cultural assumptions, uh, that gender roles are defined, that women ought to behave a certain way, men ought to behave a certain way. If you subjectively look at the world around you then and employ that subjectivity, then you won't see anything wrong with the world because it matches what you have already internalized. So understanding the objective reality critically then encourages us to get out of this subjectivity that we inhabit that has been constructed for us. So that's where pedagogy comes in, right? I'll continue reading the next paragraph. Let me uh, put it there for you. Okay. Um, a different type of false perception occurs when a change in objective, objective reality would threaten the individual or class interests of the perceiver. In the first instance, there is no critical intervention in reality because that reality is fictitious. So this is if we follow the subjective way of looking at objective reality. There is none in the second instance because intervention would contradict the class interest of the perceiver. In the latter case, the tendency of the perceiver is to behave neurotically. The fact exists but both the fact and what may result from it may be prejudicial to the person. Thus it becomes necessary not precisely to deny the fact, but to see it differently. This rationalization as a defense mechanism coincides in the end with subjectivism, a fact which is not denied, but whose truths are rationalized, loses its objective base it ceases to be concrete and becomes a myth created in defense of the class of the perceiver. Okay, so this we could argue is, you know, a further explanation of uh, the pitfalls of just looking at the reality in subjective terms, because that perception, the way we receive the reality, right? If it is totally dependent on our subjective thought, on our subjective feelings, then we will receive it as it is, right? Then it can hide its true nature. This is deeply, you know, dependent on this way of explaining, is dependent on Marx's uh, explanation of uh, ideology, right? But also, as he mentions later, Lukács' major work on uh, disalienation, like how do the workers become aware of their own exploitation? Now, remember, uh, the classical Marxists solved this dilemma of how the workers would become aware of their own uh, exploitation through different means. For example, Lenin, uh, believed that a vanguard would emerge. So that's what we call the vanguardist approach. So a vanguard would be uh, intellectuals and workers who will then train others to understand 
their own exploitation, right? Uh, there is also, uh, at a certain point, the Communist Party itself had taken it upon itself, that pedagogical role of teaching the workers about their liberation, right? What Freire is theorizing is not that someone from outside or someone from the top is going to explain the objective reality to the workers or to the peasants, but that they themselves can develop through an informed pedagogy, the critical methodology to read the reality as it is, instead of reading it in its mythologies, in how it rationalizes itself, right? That's the distinction that he's making in this paragraph. So I'll move on. Uh, this probably is going to be a not a very long lecture. OK. So the problems of perception, right? I read. Herein lies one of the reasons for the prohibitions and difficulties to be discussed at length in chapter four, designed to dissuade, dissuade the people from critical intervention in reality. The oppressor knows full well that this intervention would not be to his interest. What is to his interest is for the people to continue in a state of submersion in the face of oppressive reality. Of relevance here is Lukács' warning to the revolutionary party. And I am not going to dwell a lot on Lukács. Maybe I'll do a little. But so the interest of the oppressing class, what is their interest? Their interest is to keep the system intact, right? And to keep the oppressed from becoming critically aware of the system of oppression itself. Because unless they become critical aware, critically aware of it, they cannot transform it, they cannot change it. So the, so the system of power as it exists is, you can see that it perpetually, constantly must keep that misperception or that misrecognition functional. How do we understand that? Uh, think of any world system or a national system or a religious system. All the people who are in the positions of dominance and who get to dictate reality are constantly, okay, perpetuating the mythologies, but are also practically trying to deny the oppressed, the poor and the weak, the modes of either mobilizing or even critically understanding the system in which they exist. And that's how the system normalizes itself. Now, post Althusser, we can say that it's not necessarily done through repressive forces, though repression is a part of it, but mostly ideologically. Right. So, I mean, think of uh, what comes to your mind in my own home country, Pakistan. Right. Uh, one of the most powerful ideological forces is religion. Right. So. What do these religious scholars or religious leaders do? They constantly keep perpetuating the mythologies of gender, gender roles. Right. Or mythologies of what is permissible and what is not. Right? They police it, sometimes militantly, uh, you know, impose their will. But they are also very comfortable in telling you these are the questions you ought not to ask. And the fear behind is, is, is that if the people, if the students, if the general public starts asking these questions, then the system that they have built, right, comes to crisis. So there are different ways of enforcing that. You can make certain subjects taboo. You can make certain uh, things blasphemous, right? Have punishment for them. But all of that is meant to keep the infrastructural aspects of power in place, right? And so those who are in the oppressive condition or oppressive situation, then since they have internalized the logic of the world, they ex exist 
keep looking at that reality from that ideological point of view. And the only way they can change it is if they realize that the system within which their identities and selves are created is itself unjust. And that's where critical pedagogy, you know, comes on, right? So I'll move on to the next. And he's now discussing Luca in affirming this necessity. Okay, what is that necessity, right? Lukacs, Lukacs is unquestionably posing the problem of critical intervention to, and I, he's quoting in trans, to explain to the masses their own action is to clarify and illuminate the action, both regarding its relationship to the objective acts by which it was prompted and regarding its purpose. The more the people unveil this challenging reality, which is to be the object of their transforming action, the more critically they enter that reality. In this way, they are consciously activating the subsequent development of their experiences. There would be no human action if there were no objective reality, no world to be the not I of the person and to challenge them just as there would be no human action if humankind were not a project, if he or she were not able to transcend himself or herself, if one were not able to perceive reality and understand it in order to transform it. So as he draws on Lukacs, Lukács' explanation of how the workers would come to consciousness, right? As I, so the idea is, is that the more the people develop the capacity to look at the objective reality objectively and not subjectively, because their subjectivity is already generated by the system within which they exist, right? And the more the exploitative conditions are highlighted, made perceptible, right? Only then we will develop a subject I, right? Who doesn't want to be like the oppressor, but who as a first step understands that the conditions in which he or she exists are unjust. And that will also require you know, a transcendence from the given. What does that mean? What does that mean is to imagine a world beyond the world in which he or she or I exist, right? And that can only be done if we understand how the reality works, what are its facts, right? Who holds power, right? And then transcendence has to be individual and collective towards more freedom to be more fully human. Um, so this is on one poll. This, these are his thoughts like on the oppressed poll, right? But also to understand that, uh, that this entire, the self is a project right? Project, what is a project? It has a beginning, it has an ending, but you have to work to finish it. Then I read, in a dialectical thought, in dialectical thought, word and action are intimately interdependent. But action is human only when it is not merely an occupation, but also a preoccupation. That is, when it is not dichotomized from reflection. Reflection, which is essential to action, is implicit in Lukács' requirement of explaining to the masses their own action, just as, as it is implicit in the purpose he attributes to this explanation, that of consciously activating the subsequent development of experience, right? So this is like another nuanced layer on explaining praxis. You already know what dialectical thought is, right? When competing ideas compete, borrow from another, create another one, right? 
dialectical materialism is when the mode of production changes, a new kind of class structure emerges, right? But the crucial factor in it is that action, human action and words, right? They must come together to form a praxis, right? But only when action is not just what we do, but what occupies our mind, what constantly is at the back of our mind, that we need this praxis, words and action to change the world, right? So moving on to the next paragraph, and I'll probably conclude here today. And I read, for us, however, the requirement is seen not in terms of explaining to, but rather dialoguing with the people about their actions. In any event, no reality transforms itself. And the duty which Lukacs ascribes to the revolutionary party of explaining to the masses their own actions coincides with our affirmation of the need for the critical intervention of the people in reality through the praxis. So we have already understood what praxis is. Uh, we are trying to understand Lukacs, whose History and Class Consciousness is his major book, who is theorizing the role of an avant, uh, uh, of a vanguardist role for, for the Communist Party in training not just the workers, but in explaining to the masses their own actions. Why are they doing what and why must they do it? Freire is connecting it to the issues of pedagogy, right? So what he goes on to say is the pedagogy the, of the oppressed, which is the pedagogy of people engaged in the fight for their own liberation, has its roots here in this learning process that Lukács lays down for, for, for the political workers, for the proletariat, right? That not only we need to rethink the reality objectively, and develop a praxis, but we need to critically understand that praxis itself. Why are we doing what we are doing, right? And that's also one of the functions of the pedagogies of the oppressed. oppressed. The pedagogy of the oppressed, which is the pedagogy of people engaged in fight for their own liberation, has its roots here. And those who recognize or begin to recognize themselves as oppressed must be among, among the developers of this pedagogy. No pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distance from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and by presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in their struggle for their redemption, right? Here is where, thus where we get, you know, another layer on what pedagogy of the oppressed ought to be, right? What, we, what I just read, right? Uh, that it must be by the people, who are engaged in the struggle for liberation for their full, you know, humanization. And they are the ones who must develop this pedagogy. It cannot be a pedagogy developed at a distance from the oppressed and then offered as a remedy to them, right? because that would still be top down and it wouldn't be transformative and it will carry within it, right? The seed of the oppressive system in which that remedy is created, right? And so this is also another gesture towards false generosity, right? That you can't keep the unjust system intact and then say, oh, here, uh, we're going to create a school system for you. Here are the skills you can impart to these people. Because all that does is then gives you the skills to just be the cog in the machine of capital. So the, that kind of charity, I'm not saying it doesn't do well in the world, but it's not transformative, right? 
think of all the things governments do, uh, individuals are doing with immense with their immense wealth. All of it is these cosmetic measures. All of the things, maybe sometimes experts in the area do inform them, but these are technologies and modes of delivery, ways of doing things, educating people, you know, in the poorer parts of the world develop so far removed from them. And most of the times, people who are being helped have no say in the process of their own education, in their own learning, right? And what Freire is suggesting here is that the pedagogy of the oppressed is aimed at enabling the oppressed to see their own situation critically, develop a praxis based in reflection that can change it. But they are the ones who will develop this pedagogy of the oppressed. They are the ones who must create it through their experience, through their reflection and that it cannot be implemented from outside, especially from the top, but it must be developed, implemented, and created by the oppressed themselves and those in solidarity with them, those who have entered the world of the oppressed. So this is where I'm going to stop today. I think we are somewhere on page 53. He will go on to explain the two stages of development of pedagogy of the oppressed. Remember, we are still on chapter one. And uh, as more time is available to me, I'll continue recording these lectures and posting them uh, online. I hope these are useful to you. If you find these useful, please post some comments on the videos and let me know what you think. Uh, also, if you have a few moments, do subscribe to the channel. But most importantly, please do send me your questions and I will try to address them. Uh, and uh, hope you all are staying safe and taking care of each other. That is all I have today. I will now see you next time. And until then, as always, peace and love.